This is Tony Watley. I am a speaker, business coach, and an author, and I'm a guest on the Inspiring Show podcast. Welcome to the Inspiring Show with Paul and Jennifer Hensel, featuring inspiring interviews with thought leaders, storytellers, entrepreneurs, influencers, and legacy builders just like you. Learn from experts about finding your voice, mastering your mindset, and creating movements with your message. Tap into timeless wisdom and today's top strategies for transcending to new levels of success, happiness, and joy. Hello, everyone. I'm Paul Hensel and a co-host of The Inspiring Show. Our guest today is Tony Watley. He has a lot of experience, knowledge, and success growing multiple businesses. Tony Watley is a best-selling author, business consultant, and serial entrepreneur. He became known as the side hustle millionaire after his book with the same title became an Amazon number one bestseller. But this book is not fiction. It is based on his actual story. Tony led a successful corporate career for over 25 years. But what is more interesting is the side businesses he created, which generated millions in profit. Tony still owns a few businesses, but his real passion is teaching entrepreneurs how to start, scale, and sell their business within his podcast and consulting brand, 365 Driven. He enjoys taking on the challenge of learning new things and inspiring people to become the best version of themselves. All right. So thanks so much for joining us today, Tony. It's uh, such a pleasure to have you. I've heard a lot about you. Share a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a entrepreneur here in the Houston, Texas area. I've been here my entire life. And I guess my unique story is basically I worked in the oil and gas industry for 25 years, project management, engineering degree, but I also have a passion for cars. So I created these businesses on the side while I had a full-time job Those made millions of dollars in profit, and then I sold those. And so now I start to help other people how they build these businesses while they have a full-time job. Wow, awesome. Please share with us your journey, you know, how you got to where you are today. I think it all starts back. A lot of people ask, have you always been an entrepreneur, Tony? And I think the answer is yes, because I think it was the means of how I was able to afford toys and things like that as a child. Because I grew up with two blue collar, hardworking parents. My mom was a cafeteria worker in the public school systems her entire career. My dad was a U.S. Marine, served in Vietnam. And then when he got out, he worked in the chemical refineries here in the Houston area his entire career. And they taught me the value of hard work, that if I wanted something, I had to get out there and go do it. So I was the kid at age 12, knocking doors, asking if I could mow yards, wash cars, doing whatever I can to go make money because we didn't have allowance. We had, we always lived in fixer upper homes. Every house I grew up in was a fixer upper, usually the worst house in the neighborhood because my parents made those sacrifices for me and my sister just to live in a town that had a good school system. So that's what we did. They just encouraged the hard work and they said, Hey, you know what, if you want to go do something, go figure it out. So that's what I did. And you know, I went to the college. I put myself through college working full time as a pipe fitter, a welder, also waiting tables in the evenings whenever I could. So I, it took me seven years to graduate school and it was a struggle for me because I was just working full time. I was really sleep deprived. I think that that period of seven years is what I call my 24 seven hustle and grind that we always hear about that people sensationalize or glamorize. Now, I don't yeah. believe in that stuff. That was a carryover from what the mindset that I was really raised with, just the employee mindset is what I call it today, uh, of just really trading your time for dollars. And, and now I learned how to make money when I wasn't you know, clocking in or having to show up. That's when you start to make real money. When you start to scale, and you start to understand that time is not equal to money. Wow. Well, you know, you mentioned your dad being a veteran. Mm-hmm. So did that teach you discipline at a, at a young age though? Absolutely. My dad was a gunnery sergeant in the Marines. And so I was actually born on a Marine base. And yeah, I was very disciplined in that regard about being on time and being respectful, taking the lead, all these different things and no excuses, suck it up. You know, it's not broken rubs and dirt, you know, just that was a Marine mentality. I mean, especially a combat veteran from Vietnam. I mean, he really didn't take any excuses. And then on the other side, my mother was very disciplinary and she was a Japanese immigrant. And she was very strict when it came to education. So to give your listeners an idea of my discipline on that, I did not miss a single day of school from kindergarten through graduation. Okay. So you, not one day. Not one day. From kindergarten to graduation. Perfect attendance every single year. Wow. Wow. Tony, I, 
I am impressed by that. Wow. It wasn't my choice. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was basically if you're not dying, you're getting your ass on the bus. <laughs> so, Holy cow. Well, yeah. you obviously, you must have gone there a few times sick or under oh, the yeah. weather. Oh, yeah. I had chicken pox and, and, and colds. And I think if you're just, if you're not dying, you're getting on the bus. And that's how, and, and I'll explain that because as a Japanese woman in her era, most of the women got plucked out of the school system around junior high to go work in the farms. So okay. that was her. She didn't get to finish what we would call high school or college even because their high school in Japan is almost like junior college here. Yeah. So we think about that as like she valued education because she didn't get to have that. So when we had our opportunity to come out here and they, they made these sacrifices to live in a, in a community that was a little bit more affluent than we could afford just to have a better school. It's like your ass is going to school. <laughs> wow. Man, well, did you get good grades? Absolutely. I was top 10% straight A's, finished with honors, played varsity football, sports. I was involved in all kinds of things. So, yeah, I was one of those academic athletes. Nice. Nice. I like that. I love sports. Man, that's, I wasn't expecting that much discipline, but I'm, I'm impressed. Now, what keeps most people from starting a business? As you talked about, you know, your thing is entrepreneurship mindset. So let's kind of dive into that. I think for someone, for context, for the listeners, I'm 47. So you can get an idea where you are relative to that. But for me growing up, I didn't believe it was possible. I think most people, especially in the United States, we don't think it's possible because we, I was growing up thinking that business owners were rich people and that you had to have a family money or inherit this business. So you saw people that were successful in your small towns and you knew that they were wealthy and things like that. But you think that that's just not for me. It's not for my family. I mean, literally, my dad was the first one that lived in a home that didn't have wheels on the bottom of it. So you think about it that way. Oh, it's like we didn't understand that. Like, I didn't understand that. I didn't think it was a possibility. And actually, one of my long term legacies would be to build a public school curriculum or actually public schools that teach entrepreneurship and leadership for all students as an option, because oh, I didn't yeah. have that option. I just didn't believe it was possible. So I started my first company really as just a hobby. It's like, you know, I wanted to build a, a car thing, a car related business to make a couple extra hundred bucks a month. And it just kind of yeah. blew up from there. But what most people don't start for is that first, they don't think it's possible for them. I think the yeah. belief is what keeps them from even trying. They don't think they don't see that. You know, when you hear like, do you want to be a millionaire? Most people just don't believe it's possible. I didn't think that was possible. It happened. I started to operate and think like one and execute like one long before I became one but I never thought I would become one. Right. Hmm. And so I think that's the other thing is also, we also worry about what other people think about our failures. We, we hear a lot of times like, Oh, I'm, I'm afraid of failure. And I, that's the biggest fallacy. That is a surface level excuse that keeps most people from doing what they really need to do. And we're not, let's be honest, you know, Paul, we're not thinking about failure. We're not worried about failure. We fail all the time. We fail on a daily basis with things. We don't, we don't finish what we should start. We don't, we don't always make it to the gym. We don't always eat healthy. We, we fail all the time. We're used to failing. We fall down. We trip on the sidewalk. We, all these failures. Even when you go to the gym, the last rep of your last set, you're failing on that literally the last set. So we're used to failing. It's not, if we don't worry about failure, we say that because that's a very surface level excuse that people just kind of dismiss and they think that's the end of the conversation. But what it is, is that we're worried about what other people are going to think about our failure. We're worried about what other people are going to say about our failure. That's what we're really worried about. We don't want to, you know, think about this, Paul, we're walking down a sidewalk and you trip on something and you stumble. What is the first thing you do? Yeah. Well, I mean, to me, I'm going to, I want to recover. First well, off, because okay. if anybody's let's say, watching let's say me, I don't want to look like a dork, but. That's, that's, you said it. We look around to see if anybody saw us trip. Yeah. That's exactly what keeps people from starting something. That's exactly what keeps people from starting a business. It's exactly what keeps people from losing weight and going on a fitness program or doing anything new. They, they're, they want to do it, but they don't want it bad enough to worry about what other people are going to say about it. Uh, you know, I love the way you, you put fear like in just in that different context. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, now what, what's the difference between like the entrepreneur and the employee mindset? Cause you know, I was also an employee before, you know, I started doing what I'm doing now. So. I think that the main thing is the, the time equals money thing. That's another thing we grow up hearing. Time is money. Money is time. And if you have that and you believe that, or if you've ever repeated it, that's something you need to get out of your system because it's not true. It used to be true back when there was no internet. 
because you literally had to show up to a job and yeah. clock in and we've all had those jobs. That's just how normal people think about that. They think that's the only option that's available. They don't realize that you can actually make money when you don't have to be somewhere. They don't realize that you can make money while you're sleeping or in the shower. There's all different ways to make money nowadays. The internet, the technology, all these different online businesses that actually go on in place while you're doing other things and you don't have to be you know, clocking in. You don't have to be anywhere. You could be anywhere in the world. If you get a cell phone, if you got Wi-Fi, if you got a internet connection somewhere, you can run businesses all over the world. And so the technology has made the, this world very small, but it's also made the potential client base very big. Yeah. You build the right business models, anyone in the world could be your potential customer. So we have these people that think about business, like most people, especially in my age demographic, are a little older. Yeah. We think about, hey, you want to start a business? They think about literally like Main Street USA. They think they got to go buy a building, put a sign out put a phone number on the front window, some nine to five, you know, on the hanging on the front door. And they think that they have to show up every day. It's really a job is what they're thinking, right? Yeah, Instead yeah. of working for somebody else, they're going to go just go to their own little building and sit in there and do this all day. That's the old way of thinking guys. If you got a cell phone, that is your business nowadays. The digital connection to the internet is your business. Now you don't have to be anywhere or any time to make money. You just got to set up the right systems and build these things out and market it properly. And all this can be automated nowadays where we don't have to even try to do that. It takes time to set it up. There's no get rich quick. So if you're listening to this, you're going, oh man, this sounds easy. I'm going to go make this million dollar company. No, there's investment. There's time. Probably the first two years, you may not even make a profit. You're going to be breaking even at best. But as yeah. soon as it starts to snowball, guess what? Boom, this thing starts to multiply and it starts to scale and you go, wow, all this money's coming in. I don't have to do anything anymore. That's when most people like they quit that first year, they quit. They don't put enough effort into it. So back to your question, employee versus entrepreneur mindset. Employees still think they need to trade their time for dollars. Yeah. Entrepreneurs really understand that, hey, that's not true. I look at challenges. Entrepreneurs look at challenges and they go, hey, how do we fix this? How do we make this better? How do we improve that? They're always trying to be creative. How do we disrupt something that's annoying to most people? That's how you make a lot of money when you can figure out annoyances and solve those things for other people. So get out of the mindset of thinking that time is equal to money because it's not. Excellent. And now I'm, I'm guessing you, you do exactly what you, you, you love doing what you do. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. So, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk about, well, I got to find that one thing to make money, but they can really make money if they do it the right way on what they're passionate about. Why do you think most new businesses fail? Cause you kind of talked about that. And I mean, I mean, you know, we all know the statistics if we look them up. So yeah, the statistics, so your listeners is within the first two years, half of all businesses fail. Yeah. Pretty big number. Half of them are going to be out of business within the year too. And there's, a, there's several reasons, but one of the main ones that I find is that people do not have the passion or, a, or strong enough purpose to get them through the down times. Yeah. And, and where I'm going with that is that We've all seen people, especially on Facebook or LinkedIn or however, where we hang out, we, so we, we see friends starting something new and they go really hard at it for about three months and then they quit, right? Yeah. They disappear. You don't ever hear about that business or whatever product they're trying to sell again. It's because they didn't have enough passion or purpose into that product. They didn't have a strong enough passion in what they were selling. They may not even have believed in what they're selling themselves. Maybe they didn't even use that product themselves. The problem with those kind of people these are people that have like a different business card every six months and they're asking you like, Hey, you like, you want to come listen to this or you want to go buy this from me or here's my new thing. And these people focus on the money. They're looking for the get rich quick. They're looking for money. They just want to have money and that man. Money is the, the focus of everything. And they're always trying to find the shortcut, the, the easiest way, the easiest path to money that is going to cause you to fail because money is a very weak purpose. Purpose is what impact do I want to create in this planet? Purpose is what problems do I want to solve for other people? Purpose is what other opportunities can I create for other people to make them highly successful, to be able to make money from making them successful. So when you start to shift away from thinking about me, 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 and who am I and what's in it yeah. for me and start to shift on who can I help and who can I impact and what, do I, what can I do with this world? Like how can I get some results for them? Because that's the reward will come back to me. So you got to think about, purpose like who am I saving who am I helping who am I making more successful think bigger like that quit thinking it's all about you that reward is always going to come back to you so 
got to have a strong purpose. And those are the purposes that are going to drive you through when, when you, when you start to think like, this isn't working. It's just not, I don't know if I got it in me. I don't know if I'm good enough. And you're going to start to look at that big purpose. You're like, man, I'm not giving up on that purpose. I believe in this. I believe in this. So that's, what's going to push you through those tough times. And when you start to have the self doubt, which we all do, everybody has it, you know, even the highest successful people, we still have self doubt. We all do. That's normal. It's human behavior. But that purpose will get you through that. It'll be the guiding light through the fog that you got to go through. And if your purpose is just to make money, you're just like everybody else. You're not going to have a strong purpose. You're going to give up. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. I love that about taking the focus away from you and putting it on, you know, who you want to help. Because mm-hmm. then you're, you're going to see the benefits from that. Man, it's the same as a podcast listeners. We're, it's not about you. It's not about me. I've got my own podcast. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's, it's yeah. who are we serving? Who, who's listening to this thing? What are we doing? Are we adding value to them? Are we helping them? See, yes. it's, it's always about them. It's always about them. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that's excellent. Hey, any tips you have around, because you know, you doing some research, you talk about starting and then scaling and then selling a business. And now those are all completely different. So do you have any tips on those for listeners? I guess let's start with starting a company. Most people, we talked about why people don't really start. It's the excuses they're worried about fear. And the other thing that keeps people from starting is the the main excuse that I hear from, I'm going to do air quotes of average people, because that's what we are. We all, we all start average until we start to figure Hey, I don't want to be average anymore. I'm tired of fitting in. I need to do something different. I'm, I'm in a routine. Well, the best way to get out of that is to, to make some changes. Basically just say, I'm going to start now. I don't have to know all the answers, man. Like everybody I know, like even the people I, I mentor with and the people that are teaching me things that have built, you know, almost billion dollar companies, they didn't know all the answers. That's the, the, the best kept secret is nobody knows all the answers when they get started. They just started. And that's the way you have to be. You have to just do something, name your company, figure out what you're going to do and, and be flexible. Think about, okay, what does the market want from me? Maybe they're starting to guide you in some different direction than you originally anticipated. Oh, and yeah. you got to listen to that audience and then go, Hey, if this is what they want, maybe you should be doing this for them. And then basically pivot while you're in motion. Most people like to just, Oh, this isn't work. I'm going to quit. And then they, they disappear for six months and they regroup and they come out with some new business, new fangled idea, right? Yeah. And it's like, oh man, here they go again. So just think about that. Like it's easier to move while you're in motion and take that pe- take the people that are already following you on that journey. Go, hey, I started out as a business coach, but I'm helping people with their branding and their messaging and in their personal development. Like this is where I'm going now with this direction. You're going to keep those people with you as long as you keep the momentum. And I'll tell you, momentum is the hardest thing to get and to keep. Oh, when yeah. people let that momentum go, we've seen it in sports. You did, we talked about you like sports. Like how many times have we seen momentum swing? Super Bowl was the latest example of that. Yep. 49ers were up. They thought they yep. were up, you know, it was like 10 points and they start celebrating and they're showboating. And then one good play happens and it goes the other way and the momentum just completely swings and then they get crushed by the Chiefs. So yeah. understand momentum is very powerful. And when you have it, you have to recognize that you're in that state of momentum and you got to do things to keep throwing logs on that fire. So, yeah. And, and so for scaling, it's all about processes and systems and, and measurable things. So you got to got to get yourself away from building yourself a job and you have to build some kind of a process or system that can be taught to other people. And that's how you start to scale those things out. So most people just build themselves a job. Most people are just self-employed. They're not business owners. They build a job, you know? And, uh-huh. and so basically they can never take vacation. They, they worry about, you know, everything falling apart if they disappear for a couple of days. And if that's you and you're listening to this, you don't have a business. You have a job. You have, you're self-employed. So you got to think about who can I train? Is there a succession plan? Can I write down these steps? Can an eighth grader understand these processes? If I hand them a sheet and go, here's the processes, do these things. That's when you know your, your systems are at a, at a good level when you, an eighth grader can read them and go, okay, I get this. I, I can push this button on a computer screen. I can go to the, I can scroll to this thing and click that and, you know, that's when you have processes that are easy to follow. And then systems are how you scale those things. So if one person can be taught two, then three, then 10, then 20, you start to scale things out like that. So, yeah. and then exiting is always the, the fun part when you build up a client's business and they're ready to just sell that, to go do what they want to do. Maybe the business that you're in is generating a lot of profit and you have a good life, but you go, you know what, this isn't what I really want to do. I want to go do something else. I want to sell my company and go do that. Or maybe you want to retire. Maybe there's health reasons for reasons to leave, but 
the problem with most people is they don't think about selling their company until they have to. And that really is detrimental to them because they didn't think about this because there's certain strategies that you have to put in place to increase the valuation of your company. So it's worth more when you decide to exit. Most people do it as a reaction, like a health thing happens or someone passes away and they're like, oh crap, we got to sell this company. And they, they're scrambling and, and now their company is not really worth anything because they weren't really focused on building the value of that company. Hmm. Wow. Excellent stuff. Can we talk a little bit more about mindset? No, I, I, mindset to me is the most foundational thing there is for any level of success, whether that's in sports or business or fitness or anything. So, I mean, is there any specific things you want to know about on the mindset or? Like, are there actual tools or resources around mindset? I think that you have to gain the mindset by just keeping promises to yourself. Most people don't have a strong mindset because they don't have discipline and they don't have discipline because they can't keep promises to themselves. So when you say you're going to do something, even on a small scale, I'm not talking about, I'm going to go build this company. And like, I'm not talking about big things. I'm talking about, you know, I'm going to start getting up at five in the morning. That's a promise to yourself. And then if yeah. you sleep in till seven, you're not keeping a promise to yourself. If you say, I'm going to go get back in shape and start going to the gym three to four days a week. And then you have that on your schedule and you don't go, yeah. you're not keeping promise to yourself. You say, I'm going to start eating healthier. I'm going to start treating my employees nicer. I'm going to invest in more relationships that are going to help my business. If you don't do those things, you're not keeping promises yourself. So what happens is when you start to have this pile of things that you don't keep promises to yourself, it really hurts your confidence because you know, we, we can be shining to the world and we look like everything, we got everything sorted out we got it all together, but we know deep down inside, we're not keeping promises to ourselves because we're not getting the results and we're lying to ourselves. That's going to hurt your confidence, which is going to hurt your discipline. You're going to reinforce that negative behavior. You're not going to get the results. So start with the baby steps, every single thing, like, you know yeah. what you need to do. I always think about, for me, mindset is always about what I call future forward. I think about who is Tony in three to five years, the better, better version of me, like the more educated, yeah. the more better leadership, more knowledgeable, more successful, more healthy. I think about that version of me in, in three years. Let's use three. It's easy to, okay. easier to yep. think about. Every single decision you make on a daily basis today, you need to look at yourself in that version of you that you want to become and go, what would that future better version of me decide in this very decision today? Ah, excellent. Yeah, that's, that's, that's how you think about it. And so here's the thing. Here's the trick. When you start operating like that future version of yourself that you know you need to become, yeah. you become that person because when you start to think like that future version of yourself, you become that person. So realize that as if you're listening to this, wherever you are at in life, whether you think you're ahead or behind or whatever, wherever you are in this very moment, realize that this is a result of the decisions you made years ago. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And then, well, obviously practicing all that, it's your conscious mind's working towards it, but also your subconscious. Yeah. I've, I've become who I envisioned over yeah, the course of exactly. my entire life. I always become who I envision. And, I, and I'm never shocked by it because I've done it a few times now where I, I've got the awareness now. I look back and go, man, four years ago, I wasn't in shape like I am now, or I didn't have the success, or I didn't have that business going, or I wasn't treating people the way I should be, or I made some unethical calls that I regretted and I learned from those. And, and so you think about that things and you look back, but if you're, here's the, here's the, here's the, the hard truth, Paul. If you, if you look back, I mean, we're here at the beginning of a year. If you yeah. look back a year ago and you're in the exact same position, guess what? You're, you're not growing. You're not doing anything. You're, you're stagnant. I don't even care if you're making good money because that's where most people get stagnant. Let's be honest. If you're not desperate, if you're not trying to put some logs in the fire and learn new things and try new things and push yourself and live to your potential, you're just stagnant. And most people for, for what I've seen, most people get between like 80 to 120,000 a year income and they just get really complacent because they got mm -hmm. a new car and they've got a house and food's paid for, bills paid for, they got a circle of friends all making the same money as them and they're all telling each other how awesome and how successful they are and they're not climbing out of that box. Hmm. Yeah. They worked really hard to get to that box. They worked really hard to get to that box, but they, they lost whatever they had that got them to that level. Yeah. I, I like that. That's really good. So really it's, it's like you want to, you want to constantly look at where you want to be. Yeah. Not, not where you are. And then obviously the steps to get there. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not always a financial goal. Don't, don't get me wrong. 
I think I, I love money. I, I think, I think you can make more impact and you could definitely be happier. People say, Oh, money never buys happiness. Yeah. If you're <laughs> here, here's, I'll, I'll, I got a good response to that one because to okay. me, even when I was broke, I was happy. I've always been an optimistic type person. I've always been happy yeah. even when I was broke. So when, even when I made money, I was still happy. So if you're miserable, you're just going to be miserable with money. Like happiness and money are not related. So if something's causing you misery, depression, whatever it is, like go fix that first because it's not, a, it has nothing to do with money. You can chase all the money you want. And that's not going to go away. That's internal. So go fix that. Go hire a shrink, go do things like figure out how you're going to get better from that because that's where the people say like money doesn't buy happiness because they all know a rich person that's miserable. Like yeah. that had nothing to do with their money. You know, <laughs> yeah. you take, take, take a miserable rich person and take away all their money. Do you think they're going to be happier? Yeah. <laughs> you know? They're going to be miserable. They're going to be 10 times more miserable. So <laughs> good yeah. point. Yeah. I like that. Hey, so now you have a book, uh, side hustle millionaire. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a bit about that. Side Hustle Millionaire was a book that was rattling around in my skull for about six years. And uh -huh. it, was, it was a result of people watching what I did and my close proximity of friends were always coming up to me. Hey, Tony, you're doing so good with these businesses and you're doing with a side business? Like, how, how can you teach me that? And basically, I was helping my friends build their businesses. So the only people benefiting my knowledge were the people in my friend circle or family. And, and I was like, you know what? I should write a book. Everybody's like, yeah, you should, you should teach people what you do. Cause this is all good stuff. Like it's working. I've yeah. built, I've, I've literally built at least 12 millionaires, just friends of mine. The yeah. people that have worked for companies of mine, they became millionaires because I taught them how to do these things. And I said, you know, I need to be able to scale this. I need to build a multiple. I can't have one-on-one -on -one conversations with everybody in the world. So I need to write a book. And I've always liked writing anyway. So it's like, I always wanted to be an author. I love the title. It's a prestige thing. It's like, I want to be an author. So how yeah. do I do that? Well, I go on Google. I figure out how to write a book and I learn these things and I hire somebody that can teach me marketing and strategy. And so, okay, so, okay, I got this. I got this. I write this book. And it launched in May of 2018 and, and sold over a thousand copies in the first week. It became a number one bestseller on Amazon. And it was passing everybody in the business category that, very famous names like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon yeah. Sinek and even Donald Trump passed his book, Art of the Deal. So my little self-published book like blew past all of them became number one. But that was because I was good at marketing at the same time. So you could write the best book in the world, but if you don't, you're not good at marketing it and yeah. positioning it and building the book that people actually want, then it's not going to sell. So you got to understand that marketing and writing are equal parts important but the book itself is how to take the business ideas that you walk around with, that you pat yourself on the back. I got all these business ideas, Paul, and someday I'm going to build this business. Someday I'm going to do this. Someday, 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 someday. Everybody always talks about someday. Well, my book is how to get that idea that you're walking around with, or maybe the 10 ideas that you're walking around with, how to evaluate those ideas against each other to find the one that's going to be the best odds of success because it's about purpose, passion, and expertise, right? Those three things yeah. where the intersection of those are. We start looking at financial goals and trying to work back from those and seeing if it's realistic for that business model. And then from there, we talk to you about coming up with the logo, the branding, the structure, the marketing, the yeah. website development, naming it properly, because so many people shoot themselves in the foot just by naming their company the wrong thing. And then building yeah. the website, learning how to fund it, where do you get the money? How do you do all these things? So my idea is to take your idea and get it to a starting business. Like that's, that's the idea of the book, from zero to starting your first day of business. Nice. Awesome. Now you mentioned you, you self-published your book. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I did, Amazon, I did that Amazon as well. makes and it easy. Not, not as hard as what some people think, is it? It just takes a little time. And if you yeah. don't have the time to do it, hire someone that knows how to do it. You'll, I mean, if you really want to know how to do it, you can learn all that stuff. The information's free. Yeah. You know, Kindle, Kindle, it's kdp.com where most people need to go. That's, that's Amazon's back end. And there's a lot of videos and all kinds of stuff you can learn about writing your book. And the best thing about books is that they become really just residual income. Like I, I make over a thousand dollars a month just on that book and I don't have to do anything. It's just on there. It's, it's running its own ads. It's using some of the profits from the books to run its own ads on Amazon. So it's like this, this recurring check that just shows up every month after you get it going. It's been over a year now and it's still making the same money every month. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Passive income is pretty cool. Yeah. Cool stuff. <laughs> Again, making money while you sleep, right? That's exactly. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, let's dive into our speed round. Cool. 
Oh, I'll ask you five quick questions and you just give me first answer that comes into your head. So what, what do you do for fun, Tony? Lately, it's been more exercise. I like doing the, the big three Olympic lifts at the gym. So the oh, deadlift, cool. bench press, and squat, I've combined over 1,000 pounds, and I'm the strongest I've ever been at age 47. So, Oh, nice. Cool. All right. Uh, what's your favorite quote? Wow. I'd say that really one of my own quotes. I, I love a lot of quotes, but I came up with one that's in the back of my book, and it is that, Fear and confidence are both imaginary. Pick one and live with it. Oh, nice. I like that. Cool. Who's inspired you the most? I would say it's both of my parents. I know that's a very cliche answer, but you know, observing the hard work ethic and just really the empathy from my mom and just being well liked from everybody and understanding everybody's position. And then my dad's just really no nonsense type nature and just go do things and be the leader. Like you realize that so many people don't want to be the leader, don't want to raise their hands. And he's like, just be the one that's going to do that. Just do it, you know, and, and grow into that. And so parents definitely have been the ones that inspired me the most. I like that. That's awesome. Uh, what's your favorite book? I think for the terms of this interview, I would say that the book I would recommend that everybody, there's actually a few books that I recommend, but this one really will wake most people up on their awareness it's called Mindset, and the author okay. is Carol Dweck. And what it is, is it's a book, it's a psychology book, but it's, it's about how to identify a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. Oh. And even someone who is very growth mindset, like myself, that's optimistic, that sees the better in things, and is like to try to empathize and understand other people and how to do more things. And, and I don't subscribe to the scarcity mindset where like, Oh, if, if so-and-so becomes more successful than me, there's less success available for me. Well, that's a fixed mindset. That's a scarcity mindset. So this book really helps you understand the difference between those two mindsets, which is going to give you the awareness because there's a lot of actual examples in there that, that she shares and you're like, oh my God, like I, I say that sometimes in this situation and that's, mm. that's a fixed mindset. Like, so what it does is it builds your awareness and then you start to think like, man, I need to not think like that because this is, this is not going to, it's going to limit me. It's going to limit my behavior. It's going to limit my actions. It's going to give me excuse. It's, you know, we, there's a lot of different words for fixed mindset. We hear a lot about victim mindset and oh, yeah. scarcity yeah. mindset and fixed mind. They're all the same thing. They're all related. And then you got growth mindset, positive mindset. And those are the things that are going to expand your mind. It's going to make you more creative. It's going to start to challenge your brain instead of turning your brain off. Because here's, an exa here's, a, here's a tangible example for the listeners. When you see something and you know you want it and you're like, ah, I can't afford that. That's a fixed mindset. How many people have already said it? Everybody that's listening to you've said it. I can't afford that. What that is telling your brain is okay, I'm going to quit trying to figure out how to, you can afford that. So you basically told your brain that goal is not attainable. It's not going to happen. Or another one's like, I'll never be a millionaire. When you say something like that, I'll never be a millionaire. Yeah. Well, you just told your brain that you're never going to be a millionaire and it's going to stop looking for those opportunities to get you to that goal. Now, the right questions to ask yourself is how can I afford that? That's a growth yeah. mindset of the same answer. So when you say, how can I afford that? What you're doing is you're challenging your brain now. You're giving your brain a goal and your brain's a problem solver. It's this computer that's basically in our heads. And, and when you give it a goal, it's going to start looking for the opportunities. It's going to look for the right people to make that happen. It's looking for the path of least resistance to get to that goal. So it's going to find that goal at some point. Maybe you're going to meet somebody at a social event. And they're going to say something that's going to spark and you're going to be like, your brain's going to be like, that's it. That's it. Wake up. That's, that's the opportunity we found for mm. you to get to your goal. So you got to not turn off your brain. So if you say, how can I be a millionaire? Give, give your brain a goal. See what I mean? So this is how you're going to start to train your brain to not think about those negative things that keep you from really having those opportunities. Awesome. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's kind of what I was, what I wanted to get at uh, earlier when I talked to you about mindset. Awesome. Mm -hmm. That's good. Uh, so the, the last question in the speed round, what's a really good tool or resource you could recommend to, to our listeners? I think nowadays in the social media age and even digital age going forward, I think the most valuable tool that anyone should have yeah. is learning how to be a public speaker and learning how to do effective communication, whether that's copywriting or speaking. And here, bear with me with this because 
You're listening to someone on a microphone that had no passion in their voice that spoke really monotone that basically was afraid to do this stuff only two years ago. But I knew that if I had the message and I wrote this book and it had a potential to become a bestseller, that maybe I would get interviewed and maybe I would be on radio. Maybe I'd be on podcast. Maybe I'd be on TV. And I visioned all this to happen. It's all played out. I've been on TV. I've been on radio. I've been on pod over a hundred shows now. Yeah. And you think about that, you're listening to someone that's got emotion behind their voice and conviction and certainty. And these things I had to learn. This is not yes. a talent. Public speaking is not about standing on stage. Most people think like, well, I never want to be on stage, so I don't need yeah. to learn that. Public speaking is not giving slideshows to your, 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 your coworkers. Public speaking is getting on a microphone, getting on a camera, getting on a stage and speaking with conviction and emotion and energy and transferring the energy from yourself and into whoever's listening. So hopefully anyone that's listening to this can hear my energy and understand that this is a skill that I had to learn. It's not a talent. Most people think they can't do it. I, I was terrible at this and I would challenge anyone to go on my social media. I'll drop a link, but all my old videos are there. I joined Toastmasters. I learned how to be a pub public speaker. I learned the yes. strategy, the tactics to use my voice, stage presence, eye contact, hand gestures, all these different things are tactics that you learn to become an engaging speaker. And why is this important? Paul, we know this, like podcasting, videos, anything that's on social media, it's only going to be more important. And the thing is, is that some of you out there, especially those that have that comfort level, we talked about that income, you're like, well, I don't need to do that. I already got, you know, Tony I already built a million dollar company. I don't need to do that. I've heard that so many times from people. Yeah. And what they're, what they're really telling me is that they're going to get passed up by people who have the exact same thing as them that are willing to do the extra work to go do the things that need to be done. If you want better results, you got to do things that most people are unwilling to do. It is not comfortable to do this. Yeah. It's not comfortable. When you first launched a podcast, it probably wasn't comfortable, was it? Well, you're right. No, See? I mean, everything you start for the, for the first time is going to be somewhat uncomfortable, but you got to push that because what lies on the other side of that? Absolutely. You have to make yourself uncomfortable. You have to run at your fears. Whatever is causing you to be fearful, run at it, run at it head foot. Hey, there's got to be a way to solve this. Like for me, discovering I had stage fright when I stood up in a room to answer a question from the audience with a thousand people in the room uh, waiting yeah. for the microphone to come to me because they're, they, Oh, hold up. Let me get the microphone to you. So everybody can hear your answer. And I'm standing there as a thousand people watching me and I can just feel my body cork, you know, temperature start to rise. I can feel my throat starting to close up the cotton mouth, the sweats on top of my head starting to form. And, yeah. you know, and I was in, and I gave the answer and I applause and I sat back down at the table and I, for the next five minutes, I'm wiping the sweat off my face going, what the hell just happened? I just never experienced like what the, like I've done kickoff presentations. I've managed companies with 75 people and I'd never experienced that before in my forties. This was only three years ago. It's like, this is only three years ago. I figured that out. I was like, I actually have a fear of public speaking. I was like, uh, Hmm. A fixed mindset person would say, well, I guess I'll never be a public speaker or I can never do public speaking. Right. Oh, or, or they would say, I, I don't want to ever put myself in a situation like that again. I'll just avoid public situations where I might be potentially put on the spot. That's how a fixed mindset person says it. A growth mindset person goes, hmm, I've discovered a new fear. How do I get past that fear? Is there a way to get past that fear? Is there something I can do to get past or get better or get at least more comfortable with this fear? Well, yes, there is. Go join Toastmasters, learn public speaking, yeah. hire a speaking coach, do a lot of uncomfortable videos to get past that fear. That's the tool, man. Like just become an effective communicator is so important. Yeah. And I mean, I mean, you know, like me and you know, but just like for our listeners, um, any great speaker has worked on their craft. Like they have practiced like over and over and over and over again, and they've failed multiple times, mm -hmm. but they learn from that. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like you talk about, like you figured out you had a fear of public speaking. I would say I love being on stage, but mm -hmm. I still have th those feelings though that come up. Right. Mm -hmm. And those nervousness, you know, that whatever you get in your gut or sweating or every, I get all that too. Mm -hmm. But you know, I get, I guess you could kind of switch it. Like, it, are you excited about it or? That's right. Right. When you, when you have the skill sets and you know, you've put the time in to get better, that's when it becomes excitement until yes. then it's fear until then it's fear.
Yeah. Yeah. No, awesome. Excellent. So now how can people connect with you further? My website is 365driven.com. So 365driven.com. And from there, you'll find links to my book, my podcast, all the social channels that I hang out on. Keep it easy. One, one place to visit. Yeah. And your, your podcast is named the same thing too, right? Yep. 365 driven. Awesome. Well, that's great, man. Tony, thank you so much for being a guest. Great tips. Love everything you talked about. Love your quote. And, uh, I'm uh, looking forward to get a, get my hands on your book. Awesome, man. That. Awesome. I, I thank you for being on the show. And you know, if the listeners, if there's that one person out there listening that needs that nudge to go do something, this is it. I hope I resonated with you and I'd love to hear back from you. What a great interview, man. I really enjoyed that. I really love Tony's insights on mindset and hearing about how he looks at fear as an excuse we tell ourselves. Please check the show notes from today's episode to find out how you can connect with Tony further. Now, if you have a story and talk and you would like to be interviewed on The Inspiring Show, please go to inspiringshow.com where you can find an application. Thanks for listening, and until next time, remember, you have a story, and your story matters.